Uh, this is the Investor Readies program webinar on building financial resilience and managing cash and liquidity. Just in case you wondered why you got up at this hour of the morning. We have a panel uh, of um, Hugh Thomas from Puffin Foods and sits on the food board. Chris Terry from Peter's Foods, Finance Director. Rodri Evans, uh, Regional uh, Manager for Development Bank Wales. And Alan Lewis, Finance Director and lead on Investor Ready. I will hand over to Hugh in a moment just to introduce what the Food Board does because it's sponsored this, this programme and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of um, the subject of cash. Hugh, could you just explain yeah. what to you? Uh, thank you, John. Um, yeah, just to introduce myself again, I'm the Managing Director of Puffin Produce um, based down in Hampton West in West Wales. Um, we primarily do um, um, potatoes and vegetables into the major retailers in in their Welsh stores. Um, so that's my kind of day job. As uh, John said, I'm also on the, the Welsh Food and Drink Industry Board. Um, and we um, started that group probably four or five years ago now. And one of the work streams that came out of that group out of that group is we felt that um, food businesses in Wales needed a bit of help to upskill their kind of financial controls and you know have have a have the ability to kind of go and source help to improve their systems essentially. So hence uh, the partnership with BIC through the Welsh government, uh, you know, the investor ready program. And, you know, this series of seminars has come out of that work stream. So, you know, one of the things I would say always is if you've got any questions, you know, always come back to the BIC team. But uh, I think today we're, we're concentrating on cash and whatever. So I think uh, I'll hand back to John. It should be a good little, uh, good session. Brilliant. Thank you, Hugh. Yes, I think building financial resilience and managing cash and liquidity sounds very dry. But in reality, and I think as we've all discovered this year, um, not having enough cash at the right moment is uh, pretty awkward. Um, now, I, having been a um, small food and drink producer uh, myself and having worked in the sector all my life, I use now the guiding principle that a rather cynical and hard-bitten Lancashire cheesemaker taught me a very long time ago when he said, there's no such thing as a new customer lad, just somebody else's bad debtor. But of course, it shouldn't be that grim. Uh, I see Rodri uh, smiling there. But of course, it does beg the question, do we know who our customers are, um, their, their, their track record and their, their ability to pay? But also, are we also a bit embarrassed to ask about money? Um, you know, it's, it's a bit vulgar, um, asking for money, discussing the price, chasing those invoices that are owed to us. Um, so perhaps through this session, one question we can all ask, us, ask ourselves is, when we turn the computer on in the morning, do we know immediately what the balance is in our bank accounts? Do we know which invoices are falling due this week? Mm. Do we know who owes us money? How are we going to forecast where we'll be at the end of the day cash-wise? And of course, where we are in our own business cycle. And of course, if we chase money, you need to make sure that we're entitled to it. Have we got systems and procedures in place for purchase orders, for terms and conditions? And most importantly, do we know where we are in our business cycle? A lot of food and drink businesses rely on Christmas or a seasonal uplift. And of course, one of the things that's going to be very difficult this year is to know, are we going to end up in a better position at the end of our business cycle than where we were at the start, given all the noise and confusion in this market? So if I may start with you, Rod, uh, sorry, you, Chris, can I, can I just ask a question? I'm going to ask this of everybody. What is cash? What do we mean by cash? Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I thought, you know, I think cash is, it's any liquid funds you have access to. So, you know, we have an ID facility that we use, uh, A, because it, it, it frees up our debt straight away in terms of cash availability. Um, so, you know, our in, in, in that respect, anything we invoice is, is immediately cash for us. It's different in other businesses where you, you just mentioned you've got to wait for the debtor to pay. But, you know, cash does vary. So, you know, it, it is anything that is readily available to spend, I would say. And from, a, from your point of view, just for those people, who, when you said ID, I mean, we're talking about effectively being able to get the money from the invoices that we mm. generate today, rather than waiting 30, 60, 90 days, depending on who we're selling them to. 
how yeah, do you, yeah. how, from your point of view, from a management information point of view, how do you know where you are cash position today? Hmm. Um, well, we do a daily cash forecast. <clears throat> so we, we have a 14 day look ahead on a day by day basis. Um, because we have, you know, we have some very large direct debits that we need to be aware of when they're hitting us. So if you're managing a, a low average bank balance <clears throat> and if you've got 100,000 coming out of a direct debit one, once a month, you need to know when that's happening. Uh, so we do a 14 day rolling every day, uh, which gives us visibility of what's going to hit us in the next two weeks. Uh, we then do weekly 13 week visibility so we know what's on the horizon and we monthly we do a 12 month view. So we've got three perspectives. <clears throat> Obviously each one of those is the daily is very accurate, the weekly is less accurate and the, and the yearly is not that accurate to be fair. Um, but yeah, so we, it's all about the visibility of what's around the corner, I think. And has that forecast, notwithstanding the, uh, the, the noise and the difficulties we've had at the start of the year, as you're starting to come back, are you finding that that, um, that planning horizon, that visibility, as you call it, <laughs> yep. is, that, is that, I mean, that's accurate for you or a, a good predictor, but also something that you have to use with the people who support the business as well? <clears throat> um, yeah, we find certainly the, the 13 week one is very accurate. <clears throat> uh, obviously the 14 day one's very accurate. It's because we know what's coming immediately right to us. Um, and we can see, you know, we've seen our food service business take a real dive and we can see that coming back um, and you can see that in the cash flow uh, when you feed the sales expectation through and you drive that into cash. You can see that cash being generated in the forecast because uh, the bank balance will go from a very low or negative number to a positive number. So you can, it, it's good to see that visibility and it's, it's reality as well. Yeah. Something we'll come back to later on is, is, the, is the term over trading. And I suspect it's something that might be a hot topic this autumn as certain mm. sectors come back. Hugh, Hugh you're, you've got a fairly level business in terms of... Uh, not really, John. We, we, obviously, potatoes are kind of harvested in the autumn and then mm. stored throughout the year until next year's harvest comes along. So you get storage costs, et cetera, on top of those potatoes, kind of evaporation losses, these type of things. So we work in a kind of yearly cycle where we are prof much more profitable when the potatoes are coming off the field and we're almost kind of the end of the season and before we start harvesting again, we're making very little, if any, money at all. So, you know, but we are lucky is we can very accurately predict that raw material cost um, and because most of our business is supplying the major retailers and we've got kind of set fixed contracts with them, we can very accurately predict what is coming back in as well. So, you know, uh, you know, as Chris just said, we do a, a kind of weekly, a four weekly and a year projection. But we are very lucky that we can very accurately forecast our year projection, probably within three, four, five percent, really, um, because it's pretty locked down, you know, and that gives us quite a lot of power in this business to know exactly what cash is coming into the business, what our what our balance is going to look like in 10 months time when we're looking at CapEx projects and these type of things. That's, that's interesting because, of course, many food and drink businesses do have very seasonal uplifts. And, and of course, you know, this year particularly, we don't know quite what the availability to the market is, is going to be. No, no I, I think the kind of the Christmas and the, the the new year you know even the retailers have got no idea at the moment john as well you know we're doing various scenarios with them you know if there's a second lockdown or whatever you know what is january february and march can look like is the hardest thing to forecast at the moment yeah okay um rodri obviously um you have people um in the past i've been one of them who trail up to you and say well we thought we were going to have uh, quite a good season but we haven't generated the cash we thought we had and we're going to need more cash to get between here and christmas what what sort of information do you want to see from people and and what discipline do you expect to see from them when it comes to cash management yeah okay thanks john well i think it's very much in line with what uh, Hugh and Chris uh, have already mentioned this morning, that the key bit for us is always going to be the cash flow and the cash flow forecast and the accuracy of the information being provided. So whatever business and whatever size of business we're working with, we're always looking for them to be um, either creating or using a cash flow forecast regularly. And 
you know, the, the important thing is that, that that's a working document and that it's updated as regularly as possible with actuals against forecasts, that there's a sensible level of sensitivity built into that information uh, to cover any unexpected blips or, or delays in payments. And we're also looking for a, a safe level of headroom, if you like. We don't like to see things running too tight. So, you know, that sensitivity and that headroom goes together. We'd like to make sure that there's enough um, of a safety net, if you like, so that the businesses know they're going to be safe and, more, most importantly, can get on with running the business and not having to worry about cash on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, just, just while I think of it, can we, uh, just to, to all the, the people who are attending, we've got the chat facility. So if you want to um, bung a question across to us, use the chat facility and we'll pick it up and, 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 and feed in as we go along. Rodri, just coming back to that headroom and uh, forecast, um, people think they need to do complicated spreadsheets with all sorts of sensitivities. That's not necessarily the case, is it? No, not at all. I think, you know, the important thing for any lender is to understand the assumptions behind uh, the cash flow forecast. Uh, and as, again, some of the other panellists have alluded to, the, the further you look forward, the, obviously, the, the harder it is to be accurate. So, uh, you know, as Chris mentioned, a two-week forecast you'd expect to be pretty accurate. And then three months, you know, you'd, you'd obviously expect a bit more leeway. But again, you'd, you'd expect that to be pretty close to the mark. So, you know, depending on how the models work and what sort of system you use, you can then sort of run various sensitivities uh, within the model yourself and push out payments and, and that sort of stuff. And, you know, the, the most important thing is that you've got visibility about what you're going to need and when you're going to need it. You know, from my perspective, there's probably never been as many options out there for businesses in terms of accessing liquidity and, and short term cash. Um, but that's only true if you give yourself plenty of time. So I think, you know, that the, the longer or the, the better and more accurate the information, the quicker you know you've got an issue coming up, the more time you give yourself, then the more options you've got out there in terms of going to the market. Uh, and I think that's the, the key thing for businesses in, in trying to make sure that they're managing their cash and, and <clears throat> excuse me, liquidity is to... Uh, you know, try and see your problems coming uh, as far down the road as possible. So in a way, it's not about how beautiful is my forecast. It's more about how, what could possibly go wrong. And here are the risks. I've laid them out with some, some degree of how I'm going to cope or mitigate for those risks. Absolutely. You know, again, from, from a lender's perspective, if you're looking at a forecast where everything needs to go absolutely to plan and it's still really tight, then, you know, you, you know what happens what's your plan b what's your plan c because as we all know in business things don't always go to plan and you know things are, get delayed or take longer than expected or cost more so whenever we're looking at it I, either we're expecting to see some sensitivities built into a forecast or if they're not then we'll run them ourselves and, and sort of look at different scenarios so and i think if from a business perspective if you want credibility and to try and get, you know, as success, successful and as quick a fundraise as possible, then um, making sure that the lender or uh, lenders understood the assumptions behind your model is, is a key, uh, key thing to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, do you, 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 you advise lots of different companies and you see their forecasts and then you have to knock them into shape. What was the sort of guiding principle for doing a cash forecast and, and the sort of factors that they should be taking into consideration? Well, what we tend to do, and we do work a lot with uh, banks and the development Bank of Wales in particular, uh, so Rodri has outlined uh, what they're looking for, <clears throat> and we try on our best to work with companies, so if there's anybody out there listening that would like some assistance in producing the sort of thing that Rodri mentioned, then uh, you only need to contact us and we'll uh, provide you with some assistance. What, what, what we tend to do, and we can do this to whatever level of simplicity or whatever level of complexity that the, uh, the company wants, we will model their company. Uh, n nothing fancy, just in uh, Excel. 
uh, but we will look out for those drivers in that company, uh, you know, the simple ones like uh, your sales, uh, and model that uh, so that we produce the full set of accounting information that the likes of Hodri wants, being the profit and loss, the balance sheet, and in particular, the cash flow. Uh, but then it is easy to flex that again, as Rodri has said that they like to see, uh, play the what ifs with the information, if you like. Uh, what if you lose one of your, you know, heaven forbid, but uh, if you lose one of your major clients, what happens? Uh, if the price of your uh, raw materials goes up 10%, what happens? It's, it's that playing around with the figures to see what happens if the unexpected happens. Uh, and as I said, we can uh, assist companies do that. Mm. Actually, Chris, that's a, that's a good point. Is the, and we've had the, 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 the question from Andrew as well about forecasting. I mean, this year we're forecasting Christmas. And I know personal experience, Christmas always seems to come as a rude surprise to the food and drink industry, mainly because it's mm. strangely not the same every year. But also we've got potential for a second wave of COVID um, and also potentially hard Brexit and the impacts that had when we first had that news on currency and some of our inputs and availability of packaging and what have you. How do you risk manage all of those other factors and still give your banks and or invoice finance people the confidence that you can manage through those risks just, just generally? Mm, I think I think it's um, as Roger has said. It's about modelling the sensitivities in there. So if, if you've got a model, you can build in sensitivities on, on, on price, on payment terms, on things you don't know about. So yeah, you know, if you're going to have restrictions on imports, etc., uh, and is that going to cause a delay in getting product, therefore delay to sales? You can you can model all that in there, uh, building the sensitivities around the model. Uh, Christmas, for, in your example, Christmas is quite unusual for us because we know it's the worst time of year for us rather than the best time of year because people move, move out of the core products and buy the more expensive Christmas products for two weeks and they settle back into the, the pastries and those sort of things. But um, So we have a real cash outflow at Christmas because we've got an overhead base to cover with lower sales activity. So we know that comes and we can, we can model that as, as, uh, as a risk to the business. So we've got full visibility of that. We know it's coming and we know it's going to happen. We can put sensitivities, sensitivities around it, um, as you just discussed. <clears throat> but it's about, I think it is about having that visibility still and, and being able to model it. Yeah. And the, 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 the currency angle, I mean, do you resort or would you advocate resorting to things like hedging where there's a, the specter of Brexit yeah, and the impact yeah. it had on currency in the past. Can you can we can we hedge for that? Hmm. Um, we could cover any of the foreign commitments. I would I recommend that. I mean, as a business, we we're not affected by currency significantly. We have a very small amount of imports, uh, and we are indirectly affected. It's quite interesting because a lot of our su supplies will come by UK suppliers. Um, and they will be directly affected. We're indirectly affected. Now we can't. We don't. We don't know what will happen there. <clears throat> um, we'll obviously resist any inflation that they pass on to us due to currency. Uh, but they will presumably have to take some of the some of the pain if there is any movement in the currency. Well, they, yes, I was going to say, if you're a smaller business, I recall when uh, when. We, in 2016, we had Brexit announced. My, my wholesaler at the time told me my plastic bottles were going up 30%. Literally, you know, that was it. You know, the cost base went up. Hugh, you use an awful lot of packaging. I don't know where it's sourced from, but is that is that a, that, that spectre of Christmas, Brexit, and the potential of currency and or sort of seismic movements in what consumers might do? How do you manage that risk? Yeah, packaging is is not a great proportion of our spend, John. You know, we use these very thin 25 micron bags, you know, and it's not a not a large proportion, I think. But if you come back to kind of Andrew's question, are you planning for Brexit? You know, I suppose the answer to that is yes as well, you know, because um, you know, the retailers have been doing this for the last six, twelve months. So, you know, a perfect example of this is we're growing a lot more cauliflower for Christmas and New Year this year because the retailers are perhaps expecting disruption in the ports where 
they would have brought a lot of Spanish cauliflower in that time of year historically. So, you know, the retailers already reacted to this, you know, we've then got to manage that and whatever, but uh, Christmas is always a really busy time for us anyway. You know, when we are predicting already, you know, our, a very, very strong Christmas if people are not eating out through the food service sector for their work Christmas dinners and these type of things, you know, all of that, all of that work is going to throw flow through the retailers, you know, which uh, ends up coming through this business. So we've done a lot of work on this with the retailers already. We're, we're, we're mapping lots of scenarios. We're also mapping disruption due to Brexit, you know, and doing what we can to mitigate the risk for our customers as well as ourselves. So when we say we're mapping for these things, are we, so is it a sort of euphemism for saying we are going to need more cash because we are going to have to buy forward or we are going to have to lay down stock in the business mm. that effectively gets us back to the subject of potentially over trading in that our cash requirement for our normal business has been, has increased or has exceeded what we normally need. Yeah. And that, and that comes back to payment terms, doesn't it, John? You know, it's uh, <clears throat> what you don't want is a really big order from a really slow payer, you know, so it's, uh, <laughs> Um, you know, we have to manage all of that, you know, we, you know, we, and then we can move our terms with the retailers if they're asking us to do a lot more, you know, this is one of the things that we talk to them about. I'm sure you're going to come onto this later in the seminar, John, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we're very happy to talk about if they want us to do another thousand ton of business, we will, one of the, we'll talk about price and then we will talk about payment terms. Yeah. And I think to be fair to the retailers, they have improved, have they not, in terms of generally accepting that they can't hang on to this stuff for 30, 60, 90 days anymore. Yeah, they're spot on. They, you know, they're on the day, you know, that we we never get, you know, unless there's some kind of delivery note discrepancy or something that just gets put to one side, you know, the rest of the money just comes on, on the day it's meant to come. Just to pursue this for a moment, because I was talking to a business yesterday that's growing stuff that's not going to come to market for 36 months. And of course, they're trying to put a price mechanism in with their downstream customers, because of course, they want to buy ahead and hedge on the inputs, and they need to sell ahead to hedge on the price to know that they can cover the cost of those inputs. When we talked about mapping and planning and planning horizons, how far ahead realistically can you have a conversation with a customer about what we're going to pay for and when we're going to pay for it? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, the conversations of retailers now, they are pushing contracts out longer and longer. You know, I think, uh, you know, name, I don't want to name names, but, you know, you could almost go to kind of five-year deals with some retailers now because they see that as a mechanism of unlocking efficiency because you can spend on CapEx for automation or whatever. And, you know, they're inflation-free for four or five years. So, you know, the, there is benefits on both sides of that. So, you know, and then the payment terms is a separate thing, you know, whether you're 30, 60 or 90 days, you know, something that you've got to discuss with a retailer and they've got quite a bit of flexibility in that now, you know, they are, <clears throat> you've seen some of the, you know, the, the published headlines that they're moving to shorter terms for some of the smaller suppliers and these type of things, you know, and that, that is available. So, uh, you know, I would recommend to your person, John, is, is, you know, talk to your customer, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's do that nice and early and, uh, you know, see what they've got to say. Yeah. But that, so, um, Rodri, I mean, this is, this is the, going to characterise our autumn, isn't it? It's people having to, what we call hedging, which is effectively just trying to plan forward and nail down prices and contracts so that we've got more known knowns. How, how easy is it to finance stock term, you know, stock loans and, and the like so that people can, can carry that stock, particularly if they want to send it off-site in advance of either Brexit, as in, you know, there might be a lot of tin cans of um, rice pudding on the other side of the channel waiting to be called off or just put in cold store ready for Christmas and, and you've, you've sort of booked your spot and you've booked your price. Yeah, I, you know, I guess, John, you know, again, from a funder's perspective, nobody's expecting that business is going to cover absolutely every risk that's facing them. You know, that's not realistic. We're not expecting every base to be covered because it, it just can't be done there's inherent risks in in running businesses uh, as we all know i think you know what we would expect to see is that the risks have been identified and steps taken to try and mitigate those where possible and where that's not possible either at all or, or in part then 
look at what the implications are for the business and what steps can be taken then to uh, to address those risks and you know uh, what the implications would be for the business so the over trading which i imagine is one of those things that may well we might well start talking about this autumn is that something that you that you're mindful of and, and I'd give advice to, to clients on yeah we're always mindful of that especially you know for, for any growing business there's always going to be that risk of over trading comes back to the cash again and the liquidity uh, and it's all tied together and you know we keep coming back to this cash flow forecast if you're going to be taking on new business potentially different payment structures, different payment terms, then you've got to model that into your cash flow to see what the impact would be. Um, you know, especially for smaller businesses or businesses starting out, I think there's a lack of understanding sometimes that sometimes, you know, more business is more dangerous for your business than, than a lack of business. If you can't fund it, then you're going to run out of cash very quickly. And that's the, the major cause of failures for business. It's not a lack of profitability sometimes. It's a, it's a lack of managing cash. Well, I think Hugh alluded to that, and he was starting to sound like my uh, my Lancashire cheesemaker in that, um, <laughs> you know, salesmen come wandering into the business. Oh, look, I've got this lovely, great big new order. Blimey, that will finish us off now because of the the, the sheer requirement of cash and the uh, and disruption, and of course there's some due diligence to be done on this stuff as well. But just just coming back to that, you know, if you are growing and you're trying or you're trying to scale up again because you've quietened down in the first half of this year how should um companies apart from bringing a cash flow forecast form to you what's the sort of hierarchy of cash sources that they should be thinking about in terms of funding that additional stock to do that extra business rodri well, there's a lot of different options, John. Um, as I said earlier, I, I don't think there's ever been uh, a time where there's so many options available for businesses. Um, so, you know, anything from traditional bank finance, trade loans, overdrafts, um, alternative funders, there's invoice finance, which uh, Chris has, has mentioned, and there's been a lot of innovation in that market over the last few years. I know, uh, I think, John, you and I have spoken about it before, and there's some reluctance <laughs> uh, to enter into in most discounting facilities for some businesses. They feel that it's uh, it's going to lock them into... It's some... addictive, isn't it? Sorry? It can be addictive. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look at some of the traditional product offerings, you potentially you are locked in for, for a period of time. I think there's some benefits to it and it's a, the type of facility that can grow with your business. So when we're talking about over trading, that is potentially quite a, a simple and neat way of, of getting over that. As long as obviously you're talking to your funder and, you know, they can increase the credit limits and, and the credit line. But, you know, there's um, different products out in the market now that things like selective invoice finance. So that if you don't want to use a finance facility on a permanent basis, you can select which invoices you want to sell. That gives you flexibility uh, and availability of short-term cash. So th there's all sorts of, of options out there for businesses. Um, but and, if, from the, and from the bank's sorry. point of view, there's no shame in turning up to talk to you about a trade loan or an overdraft facility whilst at the same time looking at those other sources of finance? Mm -hmm. From a development bank perspective, we don't provide uh, overdrafts or, or trade loans. That's not the sort of uh, thing we do. We're more of a, an investment bank. But I, I think from a, you know, I come from a high street banking background. Certainly, you'd be expecting businesses to be looking at a range of options. Um, what you don't want is to be faced with a, a call, say, on a, a Friday afternoon to say, you know, I've, I've got a massive direct debit going out on Monday. I need a, a huge overdraft increase. You want people to have been uh, prepared looking at their cash and managing that so that you've got time to look at it, you know, from a funder's perspective. And as I said earlier, I think it's the better your information and the more accurate it is, the quicker and the earlier you know what your cash requirement is going to be. And the earlier you know, then the, the more options you've got. If you, you can see it coming two or three months down the line, that then there's loads of options out in the marketplace for, for most businesses. Yeah, I think, Chris, this is, you were talking about, I mean, I, I can hear people on the other side going, well, we're, we're not all as good as, as Chris is doing the 13-week planning horizon. But of course, 
you know, planning can be walking around thinking in your head, what is going to fall due? Um, but of course, it depends who you're selling to and not all customers are equal in, in this as we've sort of alluded to. How do you prioritize where you're going to get cash from and how you're going to fund business, particularly as you've already mentioned, the hospitality sector has got to come back. That's got to be funded and recharge that supply chain. And I'm guessing from our previous webinars, trade credit and trade credit cover isn't so easy. How do you manage around that? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think, as you mentioned, the, the invoice discounting facility that we use is, is, can be addictive. It's very useful when you're growing. It's very useful when you need cash on an immediate basis. Um, but in terms of, you know, our customer base, we have, you know, probably 60% is, re, is major retailers. And the other 40% is, can be very high risk customers, particularly in the food service sector uh, that we deal with. And given what's happened in the last three months, you know, we've had quite a few, well, not quite a few, we've had two that have suffered in that respect. <clears throat> so we've got, <clears throat> we've got credit insurance <clears throat> where we can get it against uh, all our customers, <clears throat> um, which, you know, again, it's a cost, but it's, it takes some of that risk away. Um, so we use credit insurance to cover some of the risk that we have with the high risk customers. Um, but again, it's ma managing those customers. You can't, you can't rely on insurance. It's the last resort. Um, so it's communication with them. It's, uh, you know, having that relationship with the customer. So you understand, you know, we, we can go through all our customers and we know who are the bad, who are the bad ones, who are the good ones. We know who we've got to chase on a, for a payment on a Friday. And then we know they weren't paid till Monday and Tuesday. And the next week they weren't paid till Wednesday. And eventually they move the payment terms back a week and a week and a week. So I think it's key to understanding the customers you're dealing with and, you know, and mechanisms you have to force them to pay, you know, to, so you don't run out of cash, uh, whether that's, you know, stopping a delivery and those sort of actions. Um, and, you know, no one likes to be without the product, but they've got to pay for it. Uh, so it, and it's a fine balance. You don't want to lose a customer for, uh, for a, uh, the sake of one delivery. Um, so it's maintaining the relate. It's having a relationship with a customer that's key, I think, in terms of managing that cash flow. That relationship, obviously, it's the formal relationship in terms of doing your due diligence on who your customer is and, yeah. and like, I guess, as well, as well as your um, ID facilities, being comfortable with them and, and, and the like. Where you don't know the customer, what do you have a do you have a procedure for sort of how you um, bring on board a, a new customer and how you get them trained to your to your credit terms? Yeah, so we'll we, we'll do pro forma initially. So um, the first couple of orders, we'll get a pro forma payment with a very a very small and high risk. Clearly, if they're one of the large retailers, we wouldn't we don't do that. You can't do that. Uh, but where they're independent traders, small shops, uh, we'll have a pro forma basis with them. Um, and then when they've got a record of maybe three deliveries, we'll review their credit rating, <clears throat> for example, Credit Safe, credit any of the credit agencies. Um, re I'll review their accounts, if they've got any accounts visible. A lot of the small ones are micro entities, so there's nothing to look at. Um, and then it's really just initial terms being low risk in terms of, you know, 30 days, 10,000 pounds in, in our case, you know, it's that sort of relationship. And if it grows, then you evaluate it again. But it's, it's small steps, I think, in terms of building that risk profile. Hugh, is that much the same for yourself or do you not see that turnover in? Yeah, well, we, we are very much a retailer facing business. We're 95%, but we do have blocks of ex excess raw material that we have to trade away. So then, you know, the kind of potato industry throughout Europe is you know, is littered with uh, bad news stories in that, in that area. So, you know, but we know our sector, you know, so we will deal with trusted partners. And, you know, if there's somebody new, it's a very similar, similar process to Chris, you know, it's starting off slowly. You know, I think what we do here as well is, is, is we're really rigorous on our credit limits, you know, for even the kind of the more trusted partners, you know, so there's, mm -hmm. if people are hitting those credit limits, you know, we're speaking to them really early and going, look, you know, I know you've ordered this for next week, but you're going to have to send us a check for this, if you know what I mean. So we're just keeping an open, you know, the finance team here are keeping a really open dialogue with those guys of, you know, keeping them within their credit limit and don't, you know, don't let that kind of 
credit limit drift over time because you're not looking at it? Yeah, I think I, I, I wasn't joking when I said about getting customers trained. I mean, in my previous life, in particularly in dairy, I mean, I remember um, asking two tankers to pull over to the side of the road and wait until we got clearance for money that had gone in the account before they rock, rocked up. It was, um, hmm. it was, you know, it's particularly difficult to run a, a business if you haven't got the raw material and that sort of sharpens the focus for people to, to pay. But as you say, that's it's not great for the relationship and it's, you know, are you better off using, do you think, uh, anybody here really, third party credit companies to go and chase your invoices? I mean, with invoice finance, that's sort of mm. being done for you to some extent, Chris? Um, well, we we don't contract that out. So we chase all our own. So we don't subcontract the, the actual collection. So we just take, we just use the cash available from the right. invoice rather than collecting it. Um, I, you know, we we we're sitting on the other side of that where we get chased by third parties that have contracted out i you know i it's not the best way i don't think um it's very impersonal it breaks that relationship with your customer or supplier um in terms of passing all that work to someone else and they they're very they can be very mechanistic in terms of how they operate as well so there's no there's no sort of leeway, no understanding of the customer that, or supplier that you're dealing with using that. It's a, it's a way of managing the, uh, the cash collection, but it's um, very impersonal, I think. And, it, and, it, and it, as you say, it risks damaging that relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, e e equally, as you say, you, you know, people chase you. I think that in any business, there's always somebody chasing, chasing for something. Um, uh, particularly in a crisis, I'm, I've always said to people, the worst thing you can do is stop talking to people because if you stop talking, they start to, in their own heads, blow any potential issue um, up out of all proportion. Um, it's, you know, the, the, that value of talking, you know? Um, you've, you've, I guess you've got more leeway out of people as a result of talking rather than ignoring them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, that's certainly good advice, I think. Um, it is about that. It's communication, I think. That's what it's about with suppliers and customers. Yeah. Um, Alan, just coming back to this business of, of short-term over-trading and, and stock, uh, stock loans. I mean, I, I, I know um, several companies at the moment who've got either a relationship like Hugh was saying with, with major retailers where they're ready to finance some of the stock they know they want built in as a contingency. What, what are the options for smaller businesses, food and drink businesses, who know they've got to lay down stock, but not sure how they're going to, one, how much it's going to cost, and then how they're going to finance it? Yeah, I think one thing that's coming out of this is that uh, we're talking about short-term cash, and we shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking that short-term cash is something that you sort in the short term. Short-term cash is something that you sort out in the long term. It can take a long time to sort it out. So it's maybe a bit of an infuriating answer to some people who find themselves in, in difficulties. Uh, but the best plan of all is to plan to make sure you don't end up in difficulties. Uh, so we're back, I think, full circle to your very first question of defined cash, in a sense, John, that, uh, yes, okay, the, you know, the simple answer, we know what cash is, it's what's in the petty cash tin and the, the balance in your bank. And then... A step above that, you have liquidity, what you can get hold of fairly quickly, collecting debt in and so on. And then you have facilities. Uh, those, uh, and you know, head, all of this has been mentioned before, so I'm just pulling it together, if you like. Uh, and the concept of headroom has been mentioned. So the trick really is to, in the long term and well before you really need uh, to cover for additional stock or whatever it is, coming back to your actual question, make sure you've got the facilities there to handle it. Or if you don't have the facilities there to handle it, pull back on your growth. You, you, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. Um, you need to plan ahead, as Godfrey has said and as everybody else has said. Uh, don't hurtle forwards and then worry about where the cash is coming from decide how much cash you've got and what you can do with it. So that means surely you've got to have management information systems that tell you which customers are worth more than the others. If you're going to, if you can't satisfy everybody, you've either got to be a bit strategic and say which customers are going to be there for the long term or a bit short term and um, 
decide which customers give you the best gross margin? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, as well as you obviously know, John, that is something, again, we can assist companies with. Uh, if they so wish, we can uh, apply, uh, you know, going back to the model I mentioned, uh, that normally breaks down any business into its component parts to see which bits are the most profitable or which bits contribute most to the profitability. And if you absolutely must make a choice between two things, yes, obviously you would uh, go in favour of the one that is most profitable. Yeah, which brings me bound to my pet subject of manufacturing the right stuff. Hugh, I guess one of the things you'll know from all the, the contact you've had with lots of food and drink businesses in, in Wales is that some people feel they've got to keep busy in, in the crisis and make just small batches and the like, not realising that they push wastage figures up, but also that the ingredients sometimes have more shelf life on them than the finished product. And you're actually you can make matters worse by perhaps not doing what Alan suggested, which is pick your customers and then make to order and try and preserve cash rather than manufacture and drive up waste. Yeah. And again, it comes back to knowing your business and you, know, you have, you know, one of the things this business is built on is knowing your margin per, per product. If you know what I mean, I think this comes back to terms. If you're, if you're on a high volume, small margin product, that you're making five percent on you can't give a five percent discount for early payment either can you so um you know it's understanding your business understanding your raw material you know and then you know talking to your customers john as you're saying it's uh you know we're, we're a very different type of business we haven't got a lot of these problems you know we are doing the full face share of tesco's potatoes in wales for example and you know that's much more regular business and you're paid more regular so you know i, I you know, I don't have to deal with a lot of this stuff day to day, but I suppose our our middle ground kind of customers, you know, we we just know those and we just keep speaking to them. And I think it's not something to be embarrassed of, John. I think, you know, it's it's you know, it's price and terms, yeah. you know, are other things coming, not just price. So uh, you know, speaking to those guys regularly and you know, and even if they have a conversation going, look, you know, I'm waiting for payment, that's hopefully coming this Friday, so I'll pay you Monday, you know, it's that's it's not a difficult conversation to have that, you know, and I don't think uh, anybody should be embarrassed about having those conversations. No, and it usually feels better and it's a lot less stressful yeah. if you've had the conversation and that know, you know, for both parties, at least they're talking to each other and they know what the situation is. I think from personal experience, both in both directions, what Chris was saying about keep the dialogue going, keep the communications going is all, is often a lot better for all concerned. Yeah. Chris, I, I, we, coming back to that business about manufacture, do you, do you get involved in terms of saying to the factory sometimes, look, <laughs> we need to rationalize and or be careful if we're in a, in a crisis situation about what we make and how we make it, maybe not make everything. Yeah, we do. We do that as a continual process. We have, even when we bring a new customer on board, um, yeah, because often they're you know they're not going to be one of the major retailers; they're going to be smaller ones um, that that we acquire during a year, and we'll have an expectation of uh, sort of volumes for those customers. <clears throat> and if the volume isn't sufficient to to manufacture efficiently, uh, because it's disruptive, if you know, if we've got uh, breaks in terms of changeovers, then um, the whole factory gets very inefficient. So we tend to minimize the number of short runs that we do and therefore we, we evaluate our customer base on a continual basis to understand their profitability and we factor in into that profitability calculation. Obviously downtime from changeovers, etc. So it becomes visible. So new, that, that, that salesman who brings in the shiny new piece of business, you've got to sit down and and reprice it effectively for the real cost and impact it has on the business. Exactly, yeah. So we'll cost downtime into that assessment of that customer. Um, and we'll evaluate it three months later when it was supposed to grow to twice its volume. If it hasn't grown, we'll have that conversation with the customer. And now we either, you know, we go back to the customer and say, we will supply you, but it'll be at this price because of our inefficiencies. And, you know, it's rather than just cut them off, we'll, we'll offer them a... A price that reflects the cost of production. Yes, a, a dairy company I won't name used to have three categorise their customers into three 
and there was the strategic customers, the semi-strategic customers, and the profitable ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit of a... <laughs> It's deciding how strategic you can be, doesn't it? Particularly at a time when uh, cash is in uh, cash is in short supply. Yep. Guys, we're, we're heading towards the end. Uh, one of the things that I, I think everybody wants to know is uh, what's going to happen between now and Christmas. And um, uh, not not to put you too much on the spot, but really, what are the bigger factors that we should be thinking about as a food and drink business? And what can we be thinking about as mitigation for them? Um, uh, Alan, if I start with you, and then we'll work our way around, please. Yeah, well, you asked me this question about a fortnight ago, and uh, I think I was the one that said I haven't a clue, John, uh, which really the answer hasn't changed because we might have a vaccine, we might have a second wave. Now, there's a bit of difference between those two poles as to what might happen, but I think the real trick is to accept that we don't know. And although these are highly exceptional circumstances or uh, situations that we're in, it doesn't remove the fact that you really need to make your business as robust as you can as quickly and as early on as you can so that you are robust and can um, survive whatever is thrown at you. And yes, I do know that there are hugely exceptional circumstances, as I said, and uh, you know, wise words might annoy some people, but that is the real trick. Make sure you are robust before you need to be robust. So remain in cash preservation mode. Don't do business unless you're confident that it's going to pay and maybe sit down with you T's and C's and, and maybe even look at contracts or any new business with a what we might call a cap or a collar and say that it can't go outside these parameters as either it'll disrupt our production or we won't make money unless it covers a certain volume. Or run the risk. Or run it's, or, your, it's the business of choice at the end of the yeah. day. But the uh, risk has got to be priced, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It depends how risk averse you want to be. You, you know, I'm, I'm not pretending to be an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is about risk taking at the end of the day. So you can be absolutely risk free, but back to robustness, be as robust. You know, the, the accountant in me is always going to say this, isn't it? Be as robust as you possibly can. So however bumpy the road gets, you're still there. Yeah. Well, we always get a more exciting response from the bankers. So Rodri, I mean, I guess you're, you know, notwithstanding what you've already said, those things that we think are going to happen in the autumn, you'd rather people who you talk to be open and upfront about what they think those risks are and the impact they have on there. Which ones do you think they will be listing as top priority? Yeah, no, absolutely, Johnny. We, we would expect people to be addressing these. But as I mentioned earlier, we also accept that, you know, you can't get it 100% spot on because nobody knows what's ahead of us. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say, you know, we've never faced uh, such a, a wide range of potential risks to the economy between COVID, Brexit, uh, poor weather, all sorts of things that, that, that could be ahead of us. So, um, yeah, as Alan said, none of us know what, uh, what's coming down the road or, uh, you know, we could probably be very rich uh, uh, if we knew that information. But um, I think it's, it's looking at the risks you know, no two businesses are the same. So it's not about using a, a standard template or, you know, a, a certain model for all businesses. It's about identifying the risks in your business and looking what the impact would be and trying to mitigate those as best as possible, but also accepting that you, you can't mitigate all the risks in the business, that, that there are going to be things that you, you can't fully cover uh, and trying to manage those um, put facilities or um things in place that, that can deal with those if they crop up and then obviously you know we're, we're all hoping that you know that the winter is going to be uh, reasonably successful but um, with so many factors you've got to plan ahead and it does come back to uh, forecasting and looking at sensitivities and making sure that you're robust and got that headroom which Alan mentioned. And yeah one of the things we've been doing with with people is doing a simple model that just tries to describe what do we think might happen and the impact it might have as in it's how big an impact it would be on the business versus the likelihood of it of it happening so it's mm. even if you're just scratching it out on a whiteboard at least you've gone through the process of thinking what could possibly go wrong. Hugh, um, 
even though you've got those those big customers and they're working in partnership with you um actually to be fair tesco did pretty much have a, a plan for um what might happen if there was a pandemic um are you in a better position what's the, the top tip that you would give for what might go wrong this autumn you know i think it's coming back to what, what chris said as well john is you know we are spending a heap of time in this business planning now so we are talking to tesco's and you know, we've got a spreadsheet and going if you give us 24 hours notice we can do this if you give us three days notice we can do this um you know and then if we do have another panic buy or whatever we will do a massive a very quick range rationalization we will drop half the the smaller short run lines you know as as chris said changeovers is a big a big driver of inefficiency in a business so we get rid of all the small lines we will do bulk bulk runs of all the big lines to be able to pile product onto the shelves you know, so all that scenario has been done but if, Obviously, of course, the financial bit that sits behind that, we've got to make sure we're covering all our overheads and we've got the matrices behind it to, to make sure we're making the right money through that as well. So all that work has been already been done with our largest customers. You know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's something we time, spend a lot of time on here to, you know, to make sure, you know, working with them to, to make sure the buyer can go to their boss within Tesco's and say, look, you know, look at, look at all, I've got all my bases covered for, the four or five scenarios that could happen for Christmas, you know, so it's been a, been a good supplier to our customers, I think as well. And what do you use as a source of information? I mean, what, because sentiment and particularly the consumer sentiment into the autumn can have a big factor in whether people go out, what they buy, what they shop for. What do you get used as a sort of bellwether for sentiment? You know, I suppose, I suppose we're getting some historic information now, John, you know, we, we saw the last panic buy, we've seen the current flow, now through the retailers, you know, we are starting to get kind of data sets of what we think might happen. You know, we know what we know what Tesco's store in Hanford West sold for the worst four days of panic buying, if you know what I mean. We know what the stock availability was throughout that day. So we know what, if the shelves have been full all day, what they would have sold. So we can work back from those figures we use in, we, know, we use yeah. in Tesco's store. Yeah, if you're a smaller business and you don't have access to that sort of market data, I mean, you, you and I have got previous in other organisations where there's been sort of economic data kicking around. What do you, you know, what do you use as a, as a bellwether for what, you know, which, what's the direction of travel here? Read the Sunday papers, John. It's a, you know, it's, you know, literally. Chris you know, Smith in the Times, etc. Yeah, we've got a good management team here. You know, we all just will sit around the table and we go, well, you know, this you know, Boris Johnson has tightened everything in England, you know, are, you know, are we heading towards a, you know, a more retailer focused Christmas again, you know, because the food service sector is not working at the house. That's a conversation we had on Monday here now, you know, so let's retweak our volumes for Christmas. You know, so we did that on Monday, you know, so it's, yeah. it's about being live and, you know, seeing all the information that's in front of us. Chris, what's, what, what's going to happen between now and, now and Christmas? Mm. What are we going to um, worry about? Well, as Roger and Alan said, it's hard to say what's going to happen, but I think our concern is probably supply chain disruption because I think it'll be different if, if we do get a second spike in COVID and Brexit later on. Um, I think there'll be localised lockdowns because of COVID, which can cause, you know, potentially, you, know, you can see where a site, a manufacturing site gets closed down because it's got a high infection rate suddenly that disrupts the whole supply chain that that's feeding into. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, we see a, the high risk of supply disruption on us um, from one of our many ingredient suppliers um, within the UK. If they're, if they're going to lock down in a certain area, <coughs> um, we can manufacture, but we may not get the supplies we need. So I think it's about managing that risk from our perspective in terms of getting dual supply in place and, and those sort of alternatives. Um, I don't think it'll be a full lockdown. I think it'll be localised and that will cause not total disruption, but specific supply disruption. Yeah. I think the, um, for those smaller businesses, is it things like um, storing stock off site and or finished stock uh, away from the premises in case mm -hmm. you do end up in one of those situations or at least well, considering those sort of things? Yeah. I mean, that was when uh, we had the last Brexit concern, wasn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of cash tied up and manufacturing output rose temporarily in that quarter due to people just piling up stock and then dipped down the second quarter after that when it wasn't needed. So, it, you know, it, hard to say really. I mean, if, you, if you've got the cash and funds to do that and you can safely store and, money, and manage risk like that, it, you, you could do it. Uh, most companies don't have that headroom or the cash available to put it into stockpiling. Um, mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, managing it without using cash almost is a challenge, I think. Yeah. So maybe getting your customer to store it for you and then invoicing them as they draw it off? A consignment stock basis, potentially, yeah. 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 So, so those sort of, sort yeah. of slightly more imaginative um, uh, of, uh, uh, of ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's worth saying, I think, for, for, for everybody is that um, that's one of the things the Investor Ready Programme is there for is helping people talk through some of those issues, manage those risks and how they're going to impact on them financially. So anyway, as I'm going to draw it to, to, to a close, one word top tip for, from everybody um, before, uh, before we leave. Alan, top tip? Make sure you've got your facilities in place. Yeah. Rodri, top tip? Give yourself plenty of time uh, to deal with any problems. Yeah, yeah, time on the ball. Mm. You, top tip? Plan and keep planning. Plan and keep planning. <laughs> yeah, forecasting. I think it's the overarching um, uh, theme for all of these webinars, really, isn't it? Chris, we've left you the last. It's most difficult top yeah. tip. Um, yeah, I think it's about visibility, really. I mean, understanding what's happening in your business in, in the next three months, six months. So you know what's coming around the corner. Um, you can plan for that, as I think... Roger said, no one, no one can turn up on a Monday morning to the bank or anyone saying we've run out of cash. You know, you need to be looking at that a month, a yeah. month ahead at least, you know. Yeah, no, I think that, that, that's it. I think that, that's great. I think, gen gentlemen, can I thank you all? Um, it's been, uh, I think it's fascinating subjects. I think it's going to get more interesting as we roll into the autumn. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. Um, to everybody else, thank you very much for rocking up at this time of the morning. Um, I hope we've made this interesting and hopefully given you some insights and some ideas. You know where we are if you want to talk about these issues further. Just to remind you that we've got a couple more of these. We've got one on around the 9th of September, which is going to be looking at e-commerce, as in the financial implications. One of the things we've learned this year is that a lot of food and drink businesses have been online and trying to make it work. Um, does it work? What's the best way? What are the financial models for that? That's what we're going to look at on the 9th of September. In the meantime, once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you for giving up your time and, and, and your attention. Thank you.